This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks, everyone. Is the volume okay? Okay. Um, so while we were waiting here, I was talking with Bob and Mike, and the question came up about, for a lot of us, how many of the decisions that we've made previous in our lives could have ended us ended us up being in prison as opposed to being, yeah, right. So let's we'll take a, take a um, vote here. Uh, I think it's important to recognize um, in the context of the prison education program that uh, although some of the guys in prison have done some really bad things, others are in there for less offensive offenses, um, drug related stuff and things like that. And a lot of them are very, very interesting people. And I hope that I will give you some perspective on that. I want to start off by thanking Adrian because she encouraged me to give this seminar today. I think I was pretty reluctant at the beginning. And after all, I think as Klaus has given you some, a little bit of flavor, um, the path that I followed through Cornell and academics has been mo oh, two or three standard deviations from the mean, whatever the mean is for academics. Um, but the path I followed has to a large extent guided me and shaped my interest and passion about teaching. And I'd like to give you some perspective on that. Um, and teaching in the prison is just, just one aspect of that. But as I was planning the seminar today, a number of my colleagues suggested that I should give some background about where my passion for teaching came from. So um, I'm gonna start off with a brief history of Tom. Um, and I'll do this for several reasons. First and probably most importantly, as I said, there's some logic to the fact that, that the things that I've done have led me to my desire to be a teacher um, and to be involved in the prison education program. But there's also a lot of you who are relatively new to Cornell who maybe only know me as a teacher that you've had in class or um, someone, that, someone that you've spoken to about measuring fluorescence, but don't really know a whole lot about, about me. And I'll admit, I think I have a pretty interesting background. It's certainly bizarre. And so I'll give you some history on that. And hopefully it'll permit us to have a little bit of fun, um, primarily at my expense. So if we're gonna have a brief history of time, we really need to start at the beginning. And it appears looking back over my history that there was some link between me and Cornell that started very early. My dad and his brother both went to Cornell as undergraduates. My dad never finished, he joined the army, but my, my uncle finished and went on to become a physician. Um, apparently I had some connection too, but what it really is, I can't remember. So here's a picture of me and my two younger siblings. Um, I was six at the time, and I have my homemade Cornell sweatshirt with the number 16. I have no idea what the basis of this was, but clearly it, it pointed my direction toward Cornell from a very early age. Now, one of the things that um, some of the students in here who are in my plant physiology class know that one of the things I complain about a lot, not a lot, but some is that the pictures that students um, give to Cornell at the time that they apply that become attached to their student records and that we see as faculty when we see our class list often look nothing like the students that they look like now. And so one of the students in my plant physiology class challenged me to make the same assessment for myself. So here I am in 1969 when I graduated from high school. And here I am a mere two years later <laughs> as a chemistry major at the University of Washington. Um, and clearly this looks like it could be a mug shot for some uh, drug related offense. Um, it's actually a passport picture. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, in the first, in the time that it took me to get my bachelor's degree at University of Washington, I actually did have two mug shots taken of me. The first very interesting circumstances, I was actually held as a suspect by the FBI for blowing up the ROTC building at the University of Washington in the fall of 1970. Um, fortunately, I had a really good alibi and was not held for that. In the second instance, I actually spent a night in jail in the small town of Montesano, Washington for riding my bike on a four-lane highway 
in order to avoid 30 miles of really crappy roads. That alibi didn't work so well for me. So my other endeavors at University of Washington actually turned out a little bit better. Uh, I started working in a lab at the beginning of my junior year. I spent so much time in the lab, it took me five and a half years to get my bachelor's degree. But one of the outcomes of this was that um, by the time I finished my degree, I'd actually published three papers. One of these papers, an interesting one, had to do with the silicate budget for the world's ocean. I spent the summer working on a Canadian icebreaker up in the Arctic. This is what it looked like in the ocean as we were taking samples, working around ice flows. Um, but the idea was to really try to put together uh, a picture of the of the silicate budget for the world's oceans. And it, it came up, there was a really interesting outcome that came from this um, that was pretty, pretty popular back then. The study permitted us to do, to basically build a model of how nutrients move through the world's oceans and back calculate to the time that the Bering Sea land bridge disappeared. And the number that we calculated from our budgets agreed very well with the other geological data. So it was a pretty popular paper. So shortly after this paper was published in Limnology and Oceanography, I was accepted into a PhD program at the University of Washington in Chemical Oceanography. I was working in the same lab that I'd worked in the previous three years. Because I'd been an undergraduate in the program, I'd already taken all the courses. So at the beginning of my first year, I decided I would take my qualifying exams. Qualifying exams back then were a little more challenging. Um, Two-day exam, eight hours each day, four essay questions total. One on chemistry, one on physics, one on biology, and one on geology. The geology question asked about the effects of silicate input by the four major Russian rivers into the Arctic Ocean and its effect on the world's silicate budget. The professor that wrote the question had clearly seen my paper, but had no idea that I was the, one of the authors of the paper. More importantly, when he graded the paper, he failed me on my question and refused a regrade. So at the end of that semester, I left the University of Washington pretty disgusted with what was going on. Um, and I took a job as a technician at Brookhaven National Laboratory in Oceanographic Sciences um, down on Long Island. And my fiance, Everina, also got offered a job there. So it was really easy for us to pick up and move there. And it was a very, very good choice on my part. It was a very successful time. By the time I started thinking about graduate school five years later, I had my name on 19 more papers. Um, I was starting to be invited to speak at national conferences, but the, the um, Department of Energy that ran the national labs and their infinite wisdom would not allow people without a PhD to present work that was done at a national lab at any meetings. So the decision for me to go and get a PhD was a relatively easy one. So to make this decision, I had to figure out where I wanted to go and who I wanted to work with. And I was fortunate that the year that I started thinking about this, the topic for the annual Brookhaven Symposium on Biology was marine photosynthesis. So we brought in world's experts on photosynthesis to, to talk at this meeting. And one night at the Brookhaven Lounge, and if you don't, haven't been to Brookhaven, Brookhaven in fact does have its own bar on the site because it's so far isolated from everything, they had to do that to attract people to come there. So one night at this bar, a group of these colleagues decided to decide my fate in photosynthesis, who I should go work for for my degrees. And the, interestingly, the result was almost unanimous. There were really only two people that I should think about working with. Warren Butler, who was at University of California in San Diego, and Rod Clayton, who was here at Cornell. The decision was that I should choose one of these labs to get my PhD and the other lab to do my postdoc in. The decision to come to Cornell for my PhD was pretty easy because everyone and I could afford to live in Ithaca on a graduate student stipend, and we probably couldn't do that very well in San Diego. As it turns out, neither one of these decisions would have been very good. Butler was all already in relatively poor health, and he died about 18 months later. Clayton's health was very good, but his wife, BJ, who had been his technician for decades, died right when I arrived at Cornell from cancer. And Clayton's response was drugs. Um, particularly cocaine. 
in the three years that it took me to complete my PhD, I never actually discussed my PhD research with Clayton. When I first came to Cornell, the first day I entered um, the plant biology building, I ran into an interesting guy. I ran into a guy who introduced himself as Neil Campbell. Now, at that time, Neil was an assistant professor here at Cornell in plant biology who was, was just ready to leave. He's leaving Cornell pre-tenure to move to a faculty position at UC Riverside. So as many of you know, Campbell is famous for his introductory biology series of books, the Campbell Biology Textbooks, the, the best-selling introductory biology textbooks in the world. But at Cornell at that time, he was really known, he hadn't published these books yet, but he was known as a fantastic teacher. And our brief meeting outside the front door of plant biology was probably the most influential one of my life. I told Neil that I was really interested in teaching. As an undergraduate, I'd been a teaching assistant in classes at University of Washington. When I was at Brookhaven, I taught three years at SUNY Stony Brook. Um, and he was really happy to hear about this, but he warned me do not tell anyone else in the department about your interest in teaching, that research is really what's all that matters at Cornell, and that if you tell people about your interest in teaching, you'll be treated as a second class, class graduate student. I never really knew why Neil left Cornell, but his advice to me certainly gives a clue. I managed to suppress my interest in teaching for more than 10 years. I'm really happy to say that when I look around at my peers and their students now, that this perspective seems to have changed, that students that are interested in teaching really get the chance to do that. But I will also say that when you consider the importance of teaching versus research, when it comes to tenure and advancement for faculty, the position of the university has not changed in the last 40 years. Okay, so I told you about my previous qualifying exam at University of Washington. So I also have to tell you about my qualifying exam here, my A exam here at Cornell. <coughs> so I had four faculty members on my committee, Rod Clayton representing biophysics, Andre Egendorf representing plant biology, Dick McCarty representing biochemistry, and Andy Albrecht representing physical chemistry. A pretty intimidating group, three members of the National Academy. And I'll admit, when I went into my exam, I was pretty nervous. Um, they took turns asking me questions. Clayton went first and he really worked me over. He in fact was the most cogent I ever saw him in the three years I was a student at Cornell. When he was done, he left the room, went out and smoked a joint, came back and giggled through the whole rest of the exam. <laughs> Jagendorf and McCarty were next and they were a bit kinder to me. They asked some pretty reasonable questions, it was fun. And when Andy Albrecht was asking me questions at the end, he asked me to derive the spin Hamiltonian for an electron in a hydrogen anion. An interesting question, so interesting that during the question, Andre Jagendorf was sound asleep, head tipped back, sawing logs, completely gone. Um, in the end, they decided to pass me. Okay, so um, as all of you are aware who have been here for a while, Cornell has influences on people. It changes us in many ways. So this is a picture of me and Everina, the spring before I started graduate school at Cornell. We were camping on the North Shore of Kauai. Three brief years later, this is a picture of me and Everina <laughs> in our backyard <laughs> just before I was finishing up my degree. Isn't it amazing what Cornell does to people? <laughs> So at the time I was finishing up, Cornell had forced Clayton to resign and they had started a search for a replacement. I had already accepted a postdoc in biophysics at the University of Chicago, but a number of faculty colleagues at Cornell encouraged me to apply for the position here. Thinking I had no chance whatsoever, I applied anyway. Interestingly, I made the short list and my PhD defense seminar was also my job seminar. Um, and after, uh, the top, the obvious top candidate for the position turned Cornell down. They offered the position to me. Something I really wonder whether they look back and feel good about or whether they regret. Okay, so because I had accepted a postdoc at University of Chicago, Cornell decided they'd let me um, 
go, they let me put back my start date at Cornell for a year and, and do one year of postdoc. So I spent actually just 10 months at Chicago, and these were scientifically the most productive time in my career. The work that I completed over those 10 months resulted in 11 publications, including one in science and one in PNAS. Of course, it took us four years to get those papers out and written, um, but it was worth it in the long run. And I'm not, I, how do I say this right? I don't say these things because I'm trying to brag. I'm saying these things because many of you only know me as a teacher and not as a researcher. Um, I was a very successful researcher and you'll see what happened in just a second. So upon returning to Cornell, I was really fortunate to get a great group of undergraduates, graduate students and postdocs to work in my lab and get the funding to support them all. This is a picture of my plant biology lab group in a photosynthesis meeting in Woods Hole in 1992, just before I received tenure. At the time, I also had three PhD students in chemistry. Now, I have to admit, I really loved having a big lab. The interaction between the students from disciplines, physics, chemistry, and biology was outstanding. It was just so much fun to be with them. It seemed like everything was going so well. About a month after I was granted tenure, my wife, Reverina, died from a brain hemorrhage. She was really the glue that held our lab together. She and I had worked together in the lab since we were undergraduates for almost 20 years. And without her, I really just didn't have the desire or the ability to run a big lab. I tell you this for two reasons. The first is this very strange parallel between me and Rod Clayton. For both of us, our wives had been our technicians for a long time and really played a huge role in making our labs work. Neither one of us could really run a lab after our wives passed away. As I said, Clayton's response was to turn to drugs. For me, I chose a different drug. I chose teaching. As my grad students and postdocs finished up their programs, I started looking for new teaching opportunities. I taught a number of classes at Cornell, but they were mostly eight or 10 students taking high level photosynthesis and algal physiology classes. About two years after, uh, after my lab started getting smaller, um, a spot opened up in BioG 101. This is our big 800 student <coughs> introductory biology course for freshman biology majors and pre-meds. Um, the first four years, I co-taught the course with various people, Carl Hopkins, David Robert Shaw, Charlie Walcott, and Bob Turgeon, before teaching it for two years on my own. During that time, I spent a lot of effort looking at the cognitive science literature and the science education literature, trying to understand what people thought were the most effective ways to go about teaching and learning. I introduced the use of clickers and active learning into the, our large biology classrooms. In 2005, I was named a National Academy's HHMI teaching fellow. and was also honored as a member of Neil Campbell's uh, initial group of biology leadership, uh, Campbell Biology Leadership Group, um, a group of faculty who were involved in teaching introductory biology around the country. That same year, I was also banned from teaching biology at Cornell by a dean who could not see beyond a small number of students who didn't like the way I was teaching because it was different. So as you might be surprised knowing me, I was slightly discouraged by this development. And I took a year leave of absence from Cornell to work for Pearson Education. That's the organization that publishes Campbell's textbook. During this year, I oversaw the development of the BioFlix series, which is 12 sort of CSI level animations, really high level animations, that looked at the dynamics of fundamental processes in biology that our introductory biology students typically have difficulty with. Things like photosynthetic and respiratory electron transport, or how does water move up through the xylem in, the, in a plant. I also helped with the development of Mastering Biology, which was an online Socratic quizzing platform, and wrote the tutorials that went along with the BioFlix animations. These two resources were credited with the 11% increase in the sales of the eighth edition of Campbell Biology over the previous edition. Unfortunately, my contract with Pearson Education did not include royalties associated with increase in sales, otherwise Cornell probably would never have seen me again. 
So, my interest in teaching took a very significant turn in 2009 when our own Bob Turgeon approached me about co-teaching a class in Auburn, at Auburn Correctional Facility with, along with him and then a plant biology graduate student named Sarah Davidson, who most of you know. This was before CPEP was actually an official organization. And Bob and Sarah had taught a similar introductory biology class at Auburn the previous year. I guess they thought that I would be an easy mark and how right they were. It was an eye-opening experience for me in many ways and showed me that I really didn't know as much about teaching as I thought I did. So I think a little history about prison education and the founding of CPEP is really appropriate here. It turns out that one of the places where the emphasis on rehabilitation as a part of incarceration um, started in Auburn Correction Faci Correctional Facility in the mid-1800s. The basic idea was to prepare individuals for reintegration into society through work, through education, and through religious studies. This basic principle held true for almost a century until the mid-1970s when the war on drugs and the concept of being tough on crime sort of took over. As a result, there were two major changes in prisons and prisoners in the United States. <clears throat> the first was that the number of prisons and prisoners exploded in the early 1980s and continued through the early 2000s. A very large part of this increase in the number of prisoners was due to individuals who were convicted of minor drug crimes as opposed to violent crimes. And the people convicted of these were dominated by racial minorities. At the same time, the US became the world leader in incarcerating its own citizens. We had more people in jail than any other country on earth, even when you look at it as a fraction of the population. Another consequence of this get tough on crime perspective was that in 1994, the US Congress declared that incarcerated individuals were no longer eligible to receive federal education support from Pell Grants. Every state that supplied similar sorts of support for prison education followed suit. And the result is that the, within just two years, the number of prison education programs dropped from several hundred to just a handful. Into this void, a number of people stepped as individuals trying to change things. Two of these people were here at Cornell, Pete Weatherby and Paul Sawyer. They um, were and still are uh, professors in the English department. And for a number of years, they volunteered teaching courses at Auburn Correctional Facility and became basically beloved there for the work that they did. In 1999, Pete and Paul did something that really changed the way things work here at Cornell for prison education. <laughs> they convinced the School of Continuing Education to offer the classes that, that were taught in prison as Cornell credit-bearing classes and to waive the tuition for these students. This agreement remains in effect to this day and is fundamental to the way, to the success of our prison education program. So Auburn was the first prison built in New York State in, nine, in 1816. And as I mentioned before, it was the place where this idea of rehabilitative incarceration began. But by the time Pete and Paul got involved in teaching in prison in the 1990s, things were pretty different. This intimidating facade gives little clue about the bleakness inside this prison. If you go to the prison, one of the things you'll see is um, one of these New York State um, signs that tells you that the first electrocution of a prisoner in the United States occurred in Auburn. And in fact, if you, until a few years ago, when you entered Auburn, right in the main entryway, hanging on the wall was a part of that electric chair. And across the street in the local bar was the rest of the electric chair. Things had changed a lot. I want to read you a few lines from an essay that Pete Weatherby wrote about prison education. Uh, I think it was about 2005 when he wrote this. I think that this really brings this idea of what's going on into focus. There was a time when education was a part of the basic 
correctional and rehabilitative mission of the prison system. As recently as the 1990s, the great majority of state correction systems offered college level programs that enabled inmates to earn two and four year degrees, usually through cooperation with local community colleges. Every state could cite studies and statistics demonstrating that providing education in prison had a direct and significant effect on recidivism, ensuring that men who had served their time had a better chance to avoid further crime and to remain free by expanding their social horizons and making them more employable. As I said, in 1994, this changed a lot. Um, continuing with some of um, Pete's writing, the concept of imprisonment that had served as the intellectual cornerstone of corrections policy for nearly a century, the concept of rehabilitation, was publicly and politically discredited. The country moved from a society that justified putting people in prison on the basis of the belief that their incarceration would somehow facilitate their productive re-entry into society, into the free world, and it changed this into one where imprisonment was merely to separate criminal offenders from the rest of society, to disable them. In other words, the concept of rehabilitation had really been lost from our prison vocabulary. In 2005, another Cornell face showed up in the uh, Auburn prisons, Mary Katzenstein, who's a professor in the government department. She had become interested in the politics of incarceration and joined Pete and Paul in teaching classes at Auburn. And in 2010, Mary was successful in getting grant support from the Sun Sunshine Lady Foundation. This is an organization founded by Doris Buffett, um, Warren Buffett's sister, had lots of money. And with this funding, the Cornell Prison Education uh, Program was officially born. We hired our first um, executive director, Jim Schechter, a fantastic guy. Jim immediately negotiated an agreement between Cornell and Cuga Community College in Auburn so that Cornell credits that our CPEP students earn could be transferred to Cuga so that they could earn an associate's degree in the liberal arts. Cornell did not want to give degrees to incarcerated um, individuals. Um, what the excuse that they used was that there's a residence requirement at Cornell. If you're not living on campus for a certain amount of time, you can't get a Cornell degree. But now, because of this agreement with Cuga Community College, we can at least get them a degree in, an associate's degree in liberal arts. So we had our first graduation ceremony in the summer of 2012. Um, that again, sitting there in the middle is our own Bob Turgeon, who then was the faculty director of the Cornell Prison Education Program, standing beside Doris Buffett, the sunshine lady, and President Larson, who's from Cuga Community College, and our first 14 graduates of the CPEP program. I honestly have to tell you that it's really difficult to explain or express the emotions that were uniformly felt during this graduation. It was one of those events that just changes the perspectives on life. Okay, so in 2013, Jim Schechter decided to change jobs to move, move into continuing education here at Cornell. And we hired Dr. Rob Scott as our new executive director. And I think it's fair to say that Rob is largely responsible for the absolute explosion in the success of the prison education program over the last five years. We've expanded from teaching in one prison to four, now including Cuga Correctional Facility, which is a medium security facility in Moravia, Five Points, which is a supermax facility in Romulus, and the maximum security prison that's in Elmira. We have grown from a staff of two to a staff of eight. Now each semester we teach 25 to 30 classes involving a similar number of faculty, postdocs, and graduate students who serve as instructors and teach about 175 incarcerated students. We've had graduations now at Auburn, Cayuga, and Five Points Correctional Facilities for a total of about 75 graduates. Now, one of the things that's really unique about Cornell Prison Education Program is the fact that we have direct involvement of Cornell undergraduates in our classrooms. 
each semester we utilize about 50 undergraduates as teaching assistants in our courses and in our tutorial sessions. In addition, we run a reflections course where these undergrads get the opportunity to talk about their experiences teaching in prison among their peers and with education and prison professionals. As you will see in just a minute, this is an absolutely remarkable experience for these students that has impacted their lives long after they left Cornell. And I really want to emphasize, this is something that is not done in any other prison education program with maybe two exceptions. It really is something that's unique to Cornell. Okay, so now that you've seen a little bit of introduction <coughs> to the prison education program, one of the questions you should be asking is, so what it's really like? to teach in a prison. Um, so I'll give you a few things that are relevant. The classes are two and a half hours to three hours long, one day a week, 15 weeks in the semester. There are no computers or any electronics allowed in the prison classrooms. We have pencils, paper, chalk, blackboards, and of course, our brains. All class content and material needs to be pre-approved by the Department of Corrections. There is a strict dress code in most of the prisons. The way I'm dressed today, you guys never see me dress this way on campus to teach classes. This is the way we have to dress for CPEP. You need to pass through a security screening every time you go in. Everything that you bring is gonna be, is gonna be scrutinized. If you're lucky, this screening takes five minutes. If you're not lucky, it takes an hour. There's no contact between faculty and students outside the classroom. No email, no office hours. We do now have weekly tutorial sessions, which our teaching assistants um, give the students assistance. The students do not have access to a research library or any access to the internet. And it's a 30 to 50 minute drive each way to these prisons when the weather's good. So you're probably asking yourself, why the hell would anybody ever want to teach in a prison? It seems like there's a lot of things that would be negative about it. And the honest answer is, for anybody who really cares about teaching, the costs don't even come close to the benefits. Although our CPEP students do not have the educational experience and background of our Cornell students, many are every bit as capable as our Cornell students in their ability to learn and think. CPEP students are highly respectful of their instructors and grateful for the opportunity to take classes. There is no feeling of entitlement among our CPEP students. Students are actually anxious to participate in class discussions and to answer questions. It is a fantastic environment if you want to practice or learn about um, techniques of active learning in the classroom. When you give these students their homework assignments, they make a real effort to do the work at the best of their ability. They really think about the material you ask them to look at. And from a lot of experience at both ends of this, I can tell you that a two and a half hour class in CPEP goes by much faster than a 50 minute lecture at Cornell. Perhaps the discussions that happen in the car on the way home from teaching with between instructors and TAs may be the best indicator. On the way home, everyone is so jazzed up by their experience, you can't help but talk about it. We're talking each, over each other all the time about all the cool, cool things that happened to us. But 20 minutes later, everyone but the driver is asleep in the car because you're so worn out from your classroom experience. Okay, how are we doing here? Good. What I would like to do now is show you two videos that are available on the CPEP website. So if you wanna go back and look at them, you can. But these are really illustrating two things. The first is a video about Cornell undergraduates who talk about their experiences being teaching assistants in our prison courses. And the second is a video where a group of our graduating CPEP students reflect on their experiences. So let's see if I can make this work.
I started learning about prisons just through personal experience. I have a number of relatives who have been incarcerated, and it wasn't until I was a junior in high school that I began to think about it more critically. And so I actually came to Cornell wanting to do the Cornell Prison Education Program. As a nation face, it disproportionately affects poor people and people of color, and it has just a multitude of disastrous effects. I'm planning on going into medicine, which is a field where people get lots of second chances. Many of the people at Auburn didn't have real first chances. So I see the work that I'm doing here as uh, contributing a small part to giving people the chances that they deserve. The first day I taught at Auburn, one guy sits down and goes, I'm going to get an A plus in this class. A friend sitting across the table from him says, no, I'm going to work hard and get the A plus. And they go back and forth for five minutes about who's going to be the better student. It was a nice entree into the program. I'm president of Writer's Block, which is an on-campus student club for, uh, it's a student publication group, and we put together writings and artworks by prisoners at Auburn and Cornell students. Last semester, we received a poem it was a love poem about the first time he met his wife. It's actually become my favorite poem that I've ever read. I knew the program existed before I came to Cornell, and I wanted to be part of it before I even got admitted to the school. Most of our guys are going to be released, and they want to make a difference in their lifestyles once they're reintegrating back into society. That's really nice to be a part of. Finding their humanity is what I joined this program for. And that's what I've been receiving. I think society has forgotten that they're human. Yeah, they did something in the past that they got them here, but they're still human beings and friendly, too. They're constantly asking very deep questions. Some of them are more engaged than Cornell students here. I took Professor Katzenstein's Prisons course, and I actually took it online over the summer. Um, and we watched The Last Graduation, and that was a film that really spoke to me a lot um, and so when she mentioned that Cornell had a prison education program that was something that I just really um, based off of what I saw in the last graduation wanted to get involved in. You're in a class with people who don't have lots of the resources and opportunities that I have on a daily basis but they are absolutely committed to what they're learning. In our early classes we asked the men why they wanted to get their degree just hearing all the different inspirations that really drove them to try something that's really difficult in a prison environment. You would hear the same sentiments echoed here on campus and it just makes you realize that education it means the same thing to a lot of people. The majority of our students haven't had a quality education. They're the manifestations of the disadvantages that come with it. I'm very privileged to be here and I recognize that. I want more people to have that access to the valuable education that I receive. An important part of the work that we do is bringing people into a classroom where, if nothing else, their minds can be liberated and they're able to think about whatever they want to think about and talk about it with a level of autonomy. The classroom, that's only one component of an education. The other component is the uh, engaged learning, is how you make what you learn on paper meaningful. No matter how much I read about people in a book, to know Mike or to know just, right? I know them personally, and so when I go and I'm fighting for these issues, there's a person behind that fight. I went into it with the mindset of like helping them, slash, you know, it's like volunteering and teaching, and they would teach me their perspective on life, their perspective on math, uh, physics, and over time I realized that I was becoming a more mature person, um, learning how to approach different populations there's a synergy there. It really becomes a rich, full experience. It's similar to the work that one can do for a lifetime. Prior to participating in CPAP, I was aware of mass incarceration, but it's now something that I absolutely see to be central to the work that I do for the rest of my life. It's really gratifying. It's been a very spiritual experience in regards to forgiveness. For students who have not done CPAP and who are interested, I absolutely encourage you to do it. You will gain so much, you will learn so much, and you will walk out of it different than the way that you came, came in. I think this is one of the most meaningful things I've uh, ever done at Cornell. I've told many of my friends and peers about it and encouraged them to volunteer. I think that this program makes Cornell as a whole a better place and really makes the world a better place. This one is about
the 2014 graduation at Auburn. I didn't expect when I came to prison to be experiencing a moment like this. I mean, it's not every day you get a chance to be with friends and family and share a positive moment. My mother's supposed to be here, my sister, my daughter, my grandson. When they come here, I hope that my family will see a changed man. This change right here marks the most important change in my life. This means evolution. Me as a human being, I've evolved. Well, it's giving me the tools that I need to think things through rather than just react to things. I mean, most of us end up here because of that. We don't think things out, we just react emotionally. And the environment feeds that once you get here. But CPAP has, has helped change that. There's a real magic to these classes. You're shaping the way the class is taught, and it becomes something more than just a class. I don't have a specific favorite. I enjoyed a lot of classes. English, because I love writing. I would have to say meditation. The instructor, she was really helpful. I really appreciated that. The things that I've learned, I'm able to really practice. I'm involved in a youth leadership organization right here in, in, in the facility. We teach civic consciousness, community service, your duty as a citizen. This program has allowed me to move forward. I was sentenced to life, so I want to live. My daughter's coming here to witness this graduation today, God willing, with the snow that she makes it through. I know he's worked so hard, and he's written so many things about me and my brother, and he does it for us. I'm very happy to see him here graduating. This year's student address will be given by Leroy Taylor. Cornell Prison Education Program is not only about education. It's about bringing people together. A lot of times we get judged for who we are on paper. They see, you know, your crime and that's all. The comments that I get back at the end of class, it lets me know that they see me for who I really am as opposed to, you know, what's being said. I cannot tell you how very proud I am of each and every one of you. You've uh, done just one heck of a job. Please welcome to the stage this year's valedictorian, Nathan Powell. Short-term gain was never the goal of liberal arts. The goal is to learn as much as possible, especially how to think, so you can give back to and enrich your community. The rest of the world had us tagged and bagged, and you came in here and you cared, and we will pass your gift on. Thank you. I just want to show them that I tried to make it right. And I messed up and I wasn't there for them, but I just want to give back. This is like my way of saying thank you. We have a responsibility to be a beacon to all those lost in the darkness, to burn away the gloom of ignorance and provide a clear path to a stronger society. One where no one's spark is left to fade and where no one's promise is left unfulfilled. Thank you. Okay, so just to finish up, um, I'm sorry, when I watched that video, I've seen it a hundred times. And eight or nine of those guys in that graduating class, I had in at least one class. One of them I had in three biology classes. He just kept taking introductory biology classes because he was so interested in, in learning. Um, but it, I can't help but get choked up when I watch that. It just, it's, it's hard to explain. Well, it's not hard to explain. Faculty here, you know, you get attached to your students. Right? You, get, you develop relationships with them. It's the same thing here. And one thing I want to say, um, I think it's important to, to recognize before I finish up, is that it's important not to view 
this cadre of students that I'm talking about as being completely representative of the entire prison population. There are some bad people in prison, but there's also people in prison, some of whom who've done bad things. One of the guys, one of my favorite students was in for a quadruple murder, you know, and he was really trying to change, turn his life around. He's going to be in jail for the rest of his life, but he wanted to get this degree so he could set an example for his kids, so he could set an example for his peers, so that they saw that there was something beyond living inside those walls. And being a part of that is really uh, something that's worthwhile. So let me um, thank the co-instructors and teaching assistants I've worked with over the years. And while you're looking at that, I'll just give you a few little statistics about the program. Since its founding in 1910, 1910 2010, CPEP has taught a total of 435 courses using 295 faculty, postdoc, and graduate student instructors, and have taught a total of almost 700 students in these four central New York prisons. <coughs> We've had graduations at Auburn, Cayuga, and Five Points, and really noteworthy for us, last summer we had 10 students at Five Points who completed our newly accredited Cornell Certificate in the Liberal Arts, an actual certificate from, that's got Cornell's stamp on it, president's signature on it. Each of these students completed an independent research thesis as the capstone for that program. It's a real step forward in the type of education that we're providing these guys. And of course, we couldn't have done this without donations and funding from a lot of organizations. Um, Sunshine Lady got us started, but we now have what we hope will be a permanent uh, support from the Mellon Foundation. We get a ton of support from Cornell Continuing Education they waive a million dollars worth of tuition each year for our students. So it's a big, a big help to us doing this. So thanks for your attention and I'd be glad to answer questions. <laughs> Dr. Bob. Well, thank you oh. so Before I, yeah, so thank you so much. I think many of us had no idea about <laughs> that Tom has been up to all those years. And I think for me personally, I was not so familiar with the prison program. It's, it is truly emotional. And for me, it was emotional to, to watch it. And so I encourage you all, you know, I don't know more, much more about than you to participate in this. So with that, questions? Uh, Could you speak for a moment about the recidivism rate for yeah. in general for not just our program, but? Yeah, so in New York State over the last 10 years, for the state prisons, the recidivism rate is around 67%. If you look at the recidivism rate from prison education programs around the country, that number is closer to 10%. Okay, so one thing you should keep in mind, in New York State, we spend almost $70,000 a year to keep a person in prison. If we can keep them from coming back in prison through prison education programs and things like that, we save a lot of money that we could do for other, we could use for other things. So when Governor Cuomo introduced the idea of, rein, of reinstating support for prison education in New York, and there was an outcry from people who said, I can't afford to send my son or daughter to college because it's too expensive. We should be thinking about the amount of money we'd be saving in New York State if we weren't incarcerating all these people. So the, 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 the statistics are really strong in terms of the effect that prison education has on the recidivism rate. Do you want to mention the students who went on to other, like, standards? Oh, that's a good point. So we have had five, five graduates in the last couple of years that have gone on to uh, degree programs at other universities. Two have come to Cornell. Actually, no, I'm sorry, six. Three have come to Cornell. One has gone to Stanford. One has gone to Columbia and one has gone to John Jay in New York. So um, we really do have very capable students who are coming out of, out of this program. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, Raul. Well. Yeah, um, so I have two questions. Um, the first one is like, do the students or participants receive some kind of like structural competency training when they're going into these programs? The undergraduates? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so the question is, do the undergraduates who are, who are functioning as teaching assistants get some training, yes. I would, um, it's probably true to say that a lot of the training is directly related to 
what you're going to encounter when you go to a prison because it's pretty different. Um, but we also give them training associated with teaching. So part of it's sort of on the job training, you learn while you're there. Part of it comes through the reflections course that we have, but part of it comes from training that we give you before you go in there as well. Yeah, when I went to structural company training, like do they get like training in like inequalities and why like certain people are in jail because of like No, no, we that's not part of the training that the um that the students get before they go in. And I think that, that sort of leads into an important point about the prison education program. Almost everyone who's involved in the prison education program is an advocate of prison reform. But prison reform is not something that CPEP advocates for. CPEP advocates for prison education. If we spent time advocating for, for prison reform, they would throw us out of the prisons just like that. Right? We have to be very careful about the things that we do. When we're in prison, we're there to teach. We're not there to be critical of the system. In fact, when we're out, when I'm a teacher in CPEP, if I went out to a prison, prison reform rally, that could end my, uh, my involvement with CPEP like that. So, so you had another part of the question. Well, the other part of the question was all like, um, can you justify the existence of prison as it operates and exists today? Like, that's obviously not Can I justify it? Oh man, like I said, there's, there are people in prison who did really bad things. You know, they probably deserve to be there. But because of the war on drugs and get tough on crime, between in the 90s and the early 2000s, we put a lot of people in prison for 30 years for three possessions of marijuana. So I'll leave that up to all of you to decide whether that's appropriate or not. You might wanna also talk about like the way it affects their family education So in case you don't know, this is my wife, Deborah, who's also involved in CPEP, is also deeply involved in teaching, and who keeps me on track all the time. Um, yeah, so a big part of what's going on here is a lot of these guys have kids outside of prison. And, you know, being in prison is not a very good example for a parent. But them getting involved in prison education, getting their degrees, we bring their families in so they can see them get their degrees. This is really inspiring for the kids. It makes a huge difference compared to if they just saw their dad, um, you know, once every couple of years in visitations in prison. So it makes a big difference as far as their family is concerned, both while they're in prison and, of course, when they get out as well. Ran you all out of gas, huh? Nope. Last question. <laughs> what kind of programs, like, certificate programs or coursework do you want to see CPAP uh, kind of tackle next? Yeah, what kind, of, what kind of things do we want to see CPAP doing next? So this new certificate program that we have where it's so, sort of like an honors program where the students actually do a research thesis. It's a little hard to do a research thesis without a library and the internet, but we make it work. Um, that sort of thing. We, what we really want to do is give the students as close an experience in prison as to what they would get if they were uh, in, in classroom outside. Um, and that means, you know, encouraging them to think about stuff outside the box, um, giving them resources to, to expand their horizons and things that they're interested in. Um, the independent study programs that we give them are really good. But talking to this audience, we always need people to teach science courses. We got lots of people from government and, and English and places down on the art squad, um, but we're short on people to teach sciences. So anybody who's interested, come talk to me and we'll get you involved. What is the selection procedure for the prisoners? Are there many more prisoners who would like to do yes. this than you can accommodate? Yes, so the, there's two main selection components. One is um, based on behavior. So if you have received what they call a ticket, basically you swore at a corrections officer, you got in a fight, or you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, you cannot be involved in the prison education program. Um, the other thing is we have an entrance exam. And the entrance exam covers both writing ability and mathematical thinking ability. Because um, we want to make sure that our students are gonna be capable of handling, we don't wanna put them in an environment where, they're, where they won't be successful. So. That's, those are the main criteria that we have. And yes, we have many more students who want to get into the program than we can keep.
age. And you have to have a GED, right? Yes, they have to have a GED or a high school high school diploma. Okay, I think class is going to cut us off here. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.